Explicitation is one of what we met earlier as the proposed universals of translation. The things that happen in language processing that are supposed to happen in translation and not in other kinds of activity. Okay? And I presented them as, as they are here. Lexical simplification or less variation. The fact that a body of translations will have fewer different words than a comparable body of non-translations. There's a possible one of adaptation, the fact that translations adapt to a target culture, but that's not particularly interesting. Uh, I also mentioned, I think, Schlesinger's equalizing uh, hypothesis, that translations will cut off the extremes of language use. They won't be ex extremely spoken, they won't be extremely formally written. They'll tend to a mid-course mid and not take risks on those two extremes. And we mentioned the unique items hypothesis. The fact that if uh, the target language has some expressions that the source language doesn't have, they tend not to be used in translations. That is, that the translators follow the forms given to them by the source language and the source text. Uh, I hope I'm summarizing. Did anybody here not uh, go through the uh, overview course? You've all suffered that. You've no need to suffer it again. Okay. And explicitation is one of them. One of those hypotheses. Okay? Um, it says that the... <clears throat> we'll see what it says in a minute. Okay. Uh, I'd like you to look at the dates there. They're all in the mid to late 1980s. Okay? And they're all coming out of what's called the Tel Aviv School. These are all researchers working in and around Tel Aviv, first with Itamar Evan Zohar, and then here, more specifically, with Gideon Turi, who uh, was also involved in, in talk of universals before formulating his proposed laws of translation. But the idea of universals really comes out of that historical uh, conjunction. It's been picked up later by people working in corporate studies because it's one of the hypotheses that is most easily tested on electronic corpora, but the intellectual work was done in, in and around Tel Aviv in the 1980s. Okay. Uh, and the Fundamental text, Bloom Kulker, 1986, is, is the, the common reference point for the study of explicitation. That said, however, the term explicitation can be found earlier in Vinay and Dabolet. I mentioned them, I think. These were the guys driving from New York to Canada. Did I give you that bit? Okay. And taking note of the street signs, the road signs. Uh, they list explicitation as one of the procedures that translators can use. Procedures, procedures, sometimes techniques. Okay? And they describe it as follows. The process of introducing information into the target language, which is present only implicitly in the source language, but which can be derived from the context or the situation. They give examples. I think St. Mary's is one of them. In English, we talk about St. Mary's, and the French that they give would back translate as the uh, private school for girls called St. Mary's. Okay? It's assumed, or we met the Eton example, uh, where in English you say Eton, and explicitation would say the private school for boys, or the exclusive school, whatever you want. Okay? Uh, Eton it would give more information. Presumably because everybody in the source culture knows what it is, but not everybody in the target culture knows what it is. That's presumably, that's one possible reason for it. Anyway, that's uh, the way in which Vinay and Dabolé use the term. Note, explicitation is not the same thing as just giving an explanation. It's not adding an explanation about what happened. It's not really adding a whole footnote, usually. It has to be something 
You've got it here. It's only implicitly in the source language. We have to be sure that it's somehow there, that it is implicit. And that's a very hard thing to be sure about. Okay? And it's not quite the same as simply being more explicit, giving more details. Okay? Um, if I say sit on the chair in one language, I translate it as sit on the chair that has four legs over there. You know, you're being more explicit, but you're not necessarily drawing out something that is implicit or meaningfully implicit in the uh, target, in the source language or source text. The term explicitation is really quite specific. It's not explanation, and it's not just a tendency to greater explicitness. We'll see some examples in a minute. Bloom Kulke, okay, for Vine Dabune, explicitation is just one of the things translators can do, among about 14 other things. It's there as a resource. Bloom Kulke uses the same term, but in a much stronger sense. Here's her hypothesis, okay? The process of interpretations performed by the translator, and I put that in bold, Vinay Dabane were comparing bits of language, road signs, texts. Okay? Vine, uh, Blue Cooking, she's starting off with a psychological process, a hermeneutic process. We've got the translator working on the text. It's a process, not just a product. Might lead to a target language text which is more redundant than the source text. What does redundancy mean? Um, uh, John is a boy. That's redundant. Because John is a boy's name, so why should I tell you he's a boy? Okay? Language is incredibly redundant. We're always saying the same thing twice. You know, plurals are, are really unnecessary. Uh, unnecessary as, as some languages. No, you can get a, rid of them. Uh, past tense, really unnecessary. Place markers, really unnecessary in most cases. Language is highly redundant. Interpreters know this. That's how you can interpret simultaneously. You get rid of some of the redundancies. Well, it's one of the reasons. Anyway, the text, the target text, the translation is supposed to be more redundant than the source text. That is, it's got more things in there that are not strictly necessary. This, this redundancy can be expressed by a rise in the level of cohesive explicitness in the target language text. That is, the markers of cohesion, those little things that bind the elements of a sentence together and bind across sentences, thus, therefore, then, okay, for example, okay, those things that knit place and time together within sentences and across them, those cohesive markers, there's going to be more of them in the translation than in the source text. She says. And this leads to the hypothesis, the explicitation hypothesis, which postulates an observed cohesive explicitness from source language to target language texts that you go, that's, that's what we just saw. Regardless of the increase traceable to differences between two linguistic and textual systems. So she's going to say, this happens, and we can't just say it happens because of the nature of the languages involved. We're going to cancel that out. This happens because of the psychology of the translator, not because of the languages. It follows that explicitation is used here as inherent in the process of translation. That is, all translating, therefore, a potential universal. And this hypothesis can be tested, and if it's found to be true consistently, then we would have a strong case for having discovered a universal of translation. Here are some examples. I've mentioned them before. Um, the easy examples are the discursive markers of cohesion, the then and the thus and the next and so, all those things. You're going to have more of them in the translation than in the source. We argue that they are implicit, okay, and they become explicit. 
The other thing I mentioned was the um, example tested by Olahan and Baker. The girl who I saw, no, it's not actually they using that clause, but you know, it, the girl who I saw, in English you can have the girl I saw, in, in the non-translations you'll have lots of the girl I saw, in the translations you have the girl who I saw or the girl that I saw. Okay? That marker, that who or that, is a marker, an optional marker of cohesion, <coughs> appearing more in the tiger language, tiger text. Is that okay? Are you handling it so far? Okay. Can you see now why it's not just explaining things? It's really more like making things clearer. That were, however, in, in the source text. It's not inventing things. It's not getting through the dictionary and throwing more information in there. It's taking those things that are sort of optional, optionally present or absent, and going for the option of making them present. Now, that basic hypothesis has been confirmed by a whole lot of people, more or less. You've got, and so lots of people have tried this and found it to be generally true. And that's interesting, because you're not supposed to do that, are you? You're supposed to reproduce what's in the text. So, if something's implicit there, why do you make it explicit on the other side? You weren't trained to do it, were you? So why should this happen? And that's why it's interesting. It's interesting because people you know, think it shouldn't really happen. Or change it. I, I told you about the that thing. That you know, once I read this, I start taking out those markers of cohesion in my translations because I know I'm being excessive there. I know I'm aware of this tendency, so I try to counter it. However, this makes it one of the things when people outside of translation studies, when people who've never heard of research, come along and I, and I say, you know, well, we're really interested in doing research on translation, and they say, oh, but we don't need theory. And I say, wait a minute, I talked about research. This isn't a theory, it's an idea, but we've done research, we've got some data. And then I start to say, well, did you know that? I say, really? No, it's not true that. Yes, it is. Look, here's the data. Oh, really? And this is one of the things, and the other universals as well, work like this, potential universals. Uh, they, you know, if they come along and say, well, you've been doing this translation studies for how long? For 40 years. Have you discovered anything? And I've got to say, hey, well, not a hell of a lot. You know. but, but look, here are some things that might be true. And it's at least a way of, of, of showing people that the research might discover things that are not just self-evident, that are even quite challenging about what we're supposed to do. What we find is not what we're really supposed to find, but we find it nevertheless. Now, to say that the hypothesis has been confirmed doesn't mean for me that we've discovered a universal. In fact, I'm one of the people who argues quite strongly that none of these are universals, as I'll try to show in a minute. But there are other problems as well. The first is, you know, in, in the picture for the course here, for this class, I've got a magician pulling a rabbit out of a hat. Now, if something has been explicitated, made explicit, we've got to be sure it was really implicit in the source text. And how can you be sure it was really there, if it wasn't there? Do you see my problem? Okay. Uh, examples. Some examples are really easy. Okay. Uh, most of them uh, actually do depend on different languages, but uh, my brother, you know, you've all heard this, my brother, and I translate it into Chinese. What's the problem? You poor Chinese people have to say if it's my older or younger brother. Right? You're obliged to be more explicit. And you can put older, but you have no way of knowing if it was actually in the source text. You'd have to sort of guess from the situation, or wing it, or hope that. Okay? Uh, it, it's one of those problems that derive from the asymmetric uh, semantic boundaries between languages. 
but should arouse doubt. How can I be sure it was really there? Now, for many of the lexical problems, uh, I think that remains a problem. Many, the lexical kinds of explicitation, such as brother, or such as eaten, or Sumerians, um, because you're not sure they're there. And I think that's why the early studies focused on grammatical explicitation. They focused on grammar words, the connectors of all, all kinds. Because there, you can be fairly sure that they were really there, because it's clear, according to the grammar of the source language, that there was an option of putting it there. And you can do a simple test, go back to the source text, put it in, doesn't mean the same thing, yes, tick, no problem. It was implicit there, therefore can become explicit. But in many cases, for the lexical items, you go back, you put it in, you think, oh, well, I'm not too sure, you know. In this context, you know, did he really mean to insist that it was an exclusive, expensive, private school for boys? Or was that extraneous to his discursive intention there? Who knows? There's got to be doubt about whether or not you're just pulling a rabbit out of a hat, inventing something that you think should have been there. A more serious problem is that when you look at texts and line them up and study them, looking for explicitation, you'll find it. But you will also find, if you look, you'll find cases of implicitation. When there is more information in the source text than in the target text. Okay? If I'm going from Chinese into English, and it's got my big brother, an English translator might justly consider this information extraneous to the purpose, and just put brother. Process of implicitation. If you put big brother, it would perhaps be putting a marked emphasis that is inappropriate. So there is implicitation. Um, implicitation is involved whenever you have cases of omission. Uh, judicious omission, simplification of a complex sentence. When I go from Spanish into English, believe me, I simplify a whole lot of sentences. I take out a whole lot of discursive parts. Visto eso se puede decir que. Seen what we have seen, it can be said that. No way, I cross all that out because it's just not used in English. Okay? And if somebody came along and looked at my translations from Spanish, they would say, I'm using a lot of implicitation. Problem. You can find a text with lots of explicitation, but with lots of implicitation as well. So what's happening? What's your hypothesis? Is it just that there is explicitation? Or should it be that there is more explicitation than implicitation. Sorry about the Spanish example. Did you understand it, more or less? Spaniards put in a lot of discursive markers. I don't know why. Very unsure of themselves. <laughs> but more to the point, English is very bare. Technical English, technical prose in English is like machine gun information. Bang, 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 bang. <laughs> You know, very rude for other people, but okay for us. Uh, so, I'm just obeying the discursive norms of the language when I translate into a more simplified uh, syntactic structure. A further problem is this. Universal is a very strong word. Not to be used lightly. Not to be used lightly in the 1980s, and not to be used lightly now either. Now, universal, to anyone working in linguistics, has got to remind you of the first Chomsky, the syntactic structures, setting out to discover deep-seated universals of syntactic structures, which would be common to all languages, and would be innate to humankind. The promise in the early, early Chomsky 1960s, as Eugene Neider picked up, was that if you go down far enough, you get a structure and then regenerate into the target language. 